Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday show in which I cover everything Starship development updates, launch news and events, and all the other best stories from Spaceflight from the past seven days. Guys, we have so much to talk about once again today from the aforementioned Starship program, big news surrounding SLS, and some orbital launches to talk about as well, as well as a few other things. Let's kick things off, starting, as usual, with Starship updates. We were a little bit spoiled for Starship happenings at Boca Chica a few weeks ago. We had spin prime tests from both Ship 24 and Booster 7, as well as, of course, static fires. I still love Starship Gazer's 8K footage of the Ship 24 static fire. This footage is absolutely amazing. Anyway, I'm reminiscing right now because not quite as much has been happening recently, at least not in front of the cameras. <laughs> Booster 7 remains in the mega bay, having the 13 inner Raptor two engines fitted to its aft section. I would imagine this is very nearly done now, so we might get to see this rolled back out to the launch site at some point over the next few days. Speaking of the launch site, that is of course where Ship 24 currently resides. Look at this picture shared by Reddit user Nonpartisan Euphonium. This is a 10k composite image of Ship 24. I've zoomed way in so you can really see and appreciate the details here. Absolutely amazing work. I love how sci-fi Starship looks. All the greebling and industrial looking details make it look like something out of Star Wars. I love it. Blue Origin visited Starbase last week in a way. <laughs> New Glenn's recovery ship, Jacqueline, which was named after Jeff Bezos's mother, was seen passing Starbase on its way to be scrapped at the port of Brownsville. <laughs> yep, it's had a long career, serving Blue Origin well for the past five years. It has caught every single orbital rocket that Blue Origin has ever flown. <laughs> but in all seriousness, Blue Origin are scrapping this vessel due to the fact that it's an old ship and needs extensive refitting just to make it functional as a regular boat, much less outfitting it to serve as a landing platform for orbital rockets. I also always thought that it was a bit sketchy to have a crewed vehicle for the landing platform rather than an unmanned barge like SpaceX. And so, what's the plan now? Well, Blue Origin are going to the same company who built the SpaceX barges for a nut and bolt copy of the SpaceX barges, which I think is sensible but also painfully ironic. Back in the day when SpaceX started testing Falcon 9 ocean landings, Blue Origin tried to sue them because Blue Origin had patented landing rockets at sea. Yeah, SpaceX had to fight quite hard for that patent to be overturned. And now here we are today, Blue Origin are just straight up copying SpaceX's barges. Maybe they should hire the guys who make the SpaceX rockets as well, haha. <laughs> I joke, but yeah, I've never been a fan of how overly litigious Blue Origin's business side can be. I bet they're glad that SpaceX won't be coming after them for cloning SpaceX tech. Hmm, so what else happened at Starbase? Ah oh, yes, the most exciting thing of all. Look, it's a bird. This is a great blue heron captured by Starbase Surfer. The Great Blue Heron is a large wading bird common near the shores of open water and in wetlands over most of North and Central America, as well as the Caribbean and the Galapagos Islands. It's a rare vagrant to coastal Spain, the Azores, and areas of far southern Europe, and admirer of starships too. There, that's gonna definitely boost this video length to appease the algorithm. If you are enjoying this video so far, then don't forget to leave a like down below and subscribe, by the way. That was a horrible segment. We're gonna move on now. Greg Scott has once again taken to the skies to photograph the latest goings on with Starbase Kennedy. He also captured this great image of a host of launch sites. We can see Pad 39A, launch site of Falcon 9, as well as the rapidly rising Starship launch tower next to it. And also this launch pad with some other rocket on it. We'll come back to this one in a bit. <laughs> At the Starbase site, we can see the crawlers for the new SpaceX LR11000 crane, which I'm assuming is going to be painted white with SpaceX liveries, much like the one we've seen at Starbase Texas. We can also see more components arriving for the third Starship launch tower, though we're still not sure whereabouts this launch tower is going to go yet, or indeed why SpaceX are already pressing ahead with a second launch pad at Kennedy. Time will tell with this one. We can also see segments 8 and 9 of the Starship Orbital Launch Tower for Pad 39A. Really not going to be very long at all now before the tower is completed. Earlier in the week, Spaceflight Now captured the rollout of Segment 7 down to the pad, where it was later stacked on the tower, which is really starting to stand proud on the Kennedy Space Center skyline. 
Kyle Montgomery took some nice pictures of some pebbles. Aww. In this photo, he accidentally caught the SLS in the background. Yep, Artemis 1 has rolled out for the final time ahead of launch. The massive orange rocket rolled from the vehicle assembly building out to launch pad 39B overnight on the 16th to the 17th of August, bringing us all one step closer to the moon. It'll actually be launching this week on Sunday the 28th, so make sure you've got the live stream bookmarked. The 42-day-long Artemis 1 mission will see the rocket launch the Orion spacecraft all the way to the moon and back on a mission that'll see it become the furthest from Earth a rocket made to carry astronauts has ever flown, followed by the fastest ever re-entry of a spacecraft built to carry humans. Artemis 1 is only a test flight, so it won't actually be carrying any astronauts. I guess this would be the modern equivalent of Apollo 4, which was the uncrewed first test flight of the Saturn V launch vehicle. The Artemis rocket will be carrying some scientific experiments though, including the Matryoshka Astrorad radiation experiment, which will test a new Israeli-designed radiation vest in the radiation environment beyond low Earth orbit, which, if successful, will be used by astronauts to protect themselves during solar storms. There are also 13 low-cost CubeSats mounted inside the stage adapter on top of the second stage of the rocket, which will be deployed after stage separation. The CubeSats originate from various companies and universities and will conduct a variety of scientific studies. One of the satellites is designed to image the interim cryogenic propulsion stage of the Orion spacecraft for mission data and historical records. It will also demonstrate the technologies necessary for a small spacecraft to maneuver and operate near the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. It seems that NASA is going with Mega Moon Rocket as the catchy headline name for the Artemis 1 launch vehicle. Should SLS be given a proper name though? Like, the Apollo program had Saturn 1 and Saturn 5 rockets. Space Launch System, to me, just kind of feels like a bit of a placeholder name. Me, personally, I'd be a big fan of the name Hyperion, because not only does that just sound really cool, but in Greek mythology, Hyperion is the brother of Cronus, and Cronus's Roman name is Saturn. So this is like the sibling of the Saturn rockets. I don't know, what do you guys think? <laughs> NASA hopes to launch the Artemis 2 mission to orbit the moon with people on board as early as 2024, with the landing mission, Artemis 3, set for 2025. Hopefully SLS faces no more major delays and all of these happen as planned. Speaking of deep space launches, we had a very big announcement from Rocket Lab last week. They announced the first ever private mission to Venus in order to support the search for life off Earth. This comes following an announcement made in September 2020 from scientists at MIT and Cardiff University who published findings of observations of possible signs of life in the Venusian clouds. They had spotted indications for the potential presence of phosphine, a gas that's typically produced by living organisms. So the stage is set for Rocket Lab, who will launch an electron rocket in 2023, carrying the Photon spacecraft which will head off to Venus, where it will deploy a probe that will descend through the clouds to an altitude of around 30 miles, where Venus's atmosphere conditions are closer to those found on Earth, contrary to the hellscape that is the planet's surface. If there really is life down there, it certainly won't be as we know it. This mission is fairly comparable to the Soviet Venera missions, which sent probes through the atmosphere and down to the Venusian surface. Best of luck to Rocket Lab on this one, I'm sure I'm not the only one who is super excited to see this one. We saw a couple of orbital rocket launches last week on Friday. One of them was a successful SpaceX Falcon 9 Starlink mission, Group 427, which launched from Cape Canaveral carrying 53 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. The booster successfully touched back down on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas shortly after liftoff, wrapping up its ninth flight overall. This booster has supported a good variety of missions, as documented in Rookland's infographic here. The next launch for this booster will be a big one for sure, hitting that double-digit mark for launches and landings. Good luck to B1062. With the success of this Starlink launch, I thought I'd quickly touch on SpaceX's big plan to have 60 orbital launches in 2022. As you can see, the success of last week's Starlink mission places SpaceX's total so far to 37, which is an amazing figure, but with only around three months to go, so around three months to go. Did I really miscalculate 12 minus 8? For goodness sake. It's 4. It's 4. 12 minus 8 is 4. Four months to go. This there. <laughs> SpaceX still have to launch 23 rockets to meet this goal. 
Do you think they'll do it or fall just short? You can see on this diagram that it's going to be close. We're just over 60% of the way through the year, and SpaceX are just over 60% of the way towards their goal. At their current launch cadence, they're expected to achieve 59 orbital flights. So it's very possible that they'll do it, especially if we include the Starship orbital test flight, which of course is expected to deploy the first ever Starlink V2 satellites, and therefore would totally count towards the successful orbital launches, even if the landing of either the ship or Super Heavy fails. What do you think? Will SpaceX hit the goal of 60? Let me know down below. The other launch we saw last week was in China. A trusty Long March 2D was launched on the 19th of August from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center in southwest China. It carried the fourth group of three Yaogan 35 satellites, which, according to official sources, have successfully entered their planned low Earth orbit and will be mainly used in scientific experiments, land and resource surveys, agricultural production estimates, and disaster prevention. However, it is fairly well understood that the Yaogan satellites primarily support the Chinese military, so it's a pretty safe bet that they'll also be used for reconnaissance purposes as well. Also on the 19th of August, the SpaceX CRS-25 Cargo Dragon autonomously undocked from the International Space Station's Harmony Module's forward docking port, shortly before departing the station. This spacecraft delivered around 2.5 metric tons of research hardware and crew supplies to the station, and has previously been used on the CRS-21 and CRS-23 missions. I would now like to give a big thanks to the wonderful list of humans whose names are scrolling on the left of your screens. Yep, they're my Patreon supporters and channel members, and it's their financial support of this channel that allows me to keep on making these videos for you all. If you want to sign up to either my channel membership scheme or my Patreon, you can do so using the links either on screen or in the description. Otherwise though guys, thank you so much for watching. There are two other video suggestions on screen that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully they're good picks, and I will uh, see you next time. That ended abruptly.